I wanted to go back to a, a time where um, th- there were still wrestling territories and actual business and things and such that was done well in the wrestling business. But from my personal experience, uh, Christmas time between Thanksgiving and Christmas of 1984 was a big time in the Mind and the Midnight Express's career because that's when we were moving from Mid South wrestling to world class. And as anybody who got the ever popular and currently once again unavailable Midnight Express book knows, we had. We had decisions to make. We went back and forth. And I wanted to tell you if, if this has ever been, even though I didn't, I've worked many more times in a month than this, but this was one of the most hectic fucking schedules uh, for everything all concerned that we've ever had. And we started Thursday, November 22nd, 1984 was the Superdome. And that was the fourth Superdome that year. We had main evented two of them and two of them we were in feature tag team title matches on, but this was the main event with the rock and roll express, the scaffold match mid South tag team title versus $25,000 of my mother's money. <laughs> and this was the blow off. We'd had the program earlier in the year with, with what well, we started off with wrestling two and Magnum TA and won the belts. And then we had the non-title program with Watson JYD, the last stampede. And then we went into the first program with the rock and roll. And after that round, we won. And they had to leave, and we lost. they lost to lose or leave town and went back to Memphis. Because as you'll remember, in the summer of 84, that's when the Fabs had left, and Jarrett needed some of his talent back. <laughs> and that's when they had those matches the Rock and Roll did with uh, Randy Savage and Lanny Poffo in Memphis, including the Wrestling Gold video with Pile Driver Through the Table. So when they had come back in the fall after the 90 days was up, then it was turned. We, you know, restarted the the angle, and then this time they were going to beat us in the ultimate blowoffs. So that way, Watts got two midnight rock and roll programs in the same year out of it. That's one of the reason why business was so good. So that was the scaffold in the Superdome, and unfortunately, that was the worst house of the bunch of them. We only did one hundred and four thousand dollars, which would be about a quarter of a million in today's money, and there was only about sixteen thousand fans there. But for the four dome shows that year, Brian. In New Orleans, once again, for the figure freaks who love it when I cite figures that just blows the shit out of uh, all these people's uh, fantasies that wrestling is bigger than ever before today. We did four shows at Superdome in 1984 that drew 75,000 fans approximately, paying a total of $611,000. And that was a town where there were 25 other shows in New Orleans at either the downtown auditorium or the UNO Lakefront Arena that year. So for all of the shows with the domes, 160,000 fans paying about $1.2 million if in just New Orleans in 1984. So that was a nice little night. We made $1,000, which wasn't our best dome payoff, but of course Watts was stingy and it didn't draw. Uh, but <laughs> it didn't draw like the other ones did. But then the next night in Houston, we go to Houston and have the scaffold match there. And the house was $89,800, uh, which was a sellout. If the fire marshal had not been there, we probably could have rivaled the house we did for the last stampede, but uh, still another 12,000 people. So we made another $1,200. That's 2,200 bucks in two days work at two house shows, which is today about almost six grand. And the promotion did $200,000 in two days, which would be almost half a million in today's money. Of course, for the Superdome event, I should say it was a 400-mile round trip from our home. Where then after we got back at 3 o'clock in the morning, we left the next day at noon to get to Houston because <laughs> that was another 500-mile round trip. Um, that meant that Houston that year for 24 Mid-South Wrestling shows had drawn approximately 175,000 fans paying about one point. One five million dollars. That's one million one hundred fifty thousand dollars in that city alone that year. Wow, wow. Uh, so then we go to Alexandria, Louisiana. We were home, and they we didn't do a scaffold there. They hung me in a straight jacket from a fucking cherry picker, and we did ten grand. <laughs> and, uh, the next day, Sunday, November twenty fifth, was Lafayette, Louisiana. So that was a four hundred mile round trip and two shows in one day. Um, we made 300 bucks, uh, uh, nothing fancy in, in, on those shows. Although in Homa, that was the night I'm looking at this, a lot of this for the first time in a while, the, the midnight face, the rock and roll express. I was in a straight jacket at ringside and it was Homa, Louisiana. So I told Grizzly Smith, I said, 
we're about to finish up and I'm not going to sit out there at ringside in a straight jacket because those people will kill me and I'll be defenseless. And he said, how about this? So base Grizzly was 6'10", 400 pounds, right? He put me in a straight jacket at ringside and he set me in a fucking folding chair and then he pulled another chair up behind me and sat with one leg on one side of me, one leg on the other side of me and both his hands on my shoulders. And they told the people it was so there was no way I could interfere, but actually it was because so there was no way that the fans could murder me. That's the only reason I agreed <laughs> to that that night. So that was a last minute change in the stipulation. <clears throat> then the next day, Monday, November 26th, we went to Monroe, Nor uh, Monroe, North Carolina, Monroe, Louisiana, where we had a scaffold match and it didn't fucking draw worse shit. And we made $150 and I don't know what happened to Monroe. Uh, but then I went on to Jackson, Mississippi, where I was on the radio live Tix 94 T Y X. The rock and roll station there was Scott Mateer. He was a big rock and roll fan. As a matter of fact, earlier in the year, he had uh, asked for a guest in studio again. And, and Dundee said, well, Cornette, you've seen Jimmy Hart do the radio. You go do the radio. So I cranked this fucking guy up about how rock and roll sucked and so did country music. And I was a fan of Barry Manilow and his rock and roll express. were going to get their ass kicked the next night. If he didn't believe it, why didn't he come down there and see it and took some phone calls by the time I got finished rousing the people up, right? They were hot. So we go the next night, we go to the show and Dundee comes in the locker room, says, what you do on the fucking radio? And he had told me before, and he said, now watch it. Those radio guys are sharp. They might get you to say something you shouldn't say. I said, don't worry, Bill. I got it. What'd you say on the radio? I said, what are you talking about? He said, the fucking DJ's here. He wants to manage the rock and roll. I said, well, he ought to come to ringside and fucking see for himself. I didn't tell him to manage him, but said, he said, well, you think we can let him manage without smartening him up? I said, why? He said, because the fucking advance is double and they're lined up at the ticket window. We doubled the fucking house from the night before, or from the show before to see the DJ get his ass kicked. Anyway. So I would did the radio again with him on the November 27th date. So I was off, but listen to this Monday night after Monroe, I drove to Jackson, which was a hundred miles Tuesday. I was on the radio in the morning, but then I had to go to Alexandria back to my house, 200 miles that day after the radio. And then the next morning I had to get up at six o'clock and go back to Shreveport, which is 130 miles in the other direction to do six hours of local promos and then drive 200 miles back to Jackson, Mississippi <laughs> that I just left the morning before. So we could have the fucking scaffold match in front of a $30,000 house and a $400 payoff. But Thursday, November 29th, we left home and drove 250 miles each way to Biloxi, Mississippi and back for another scaffold match. And Biloxi was a shit town, but it still did 18 grand. Uh, the next day, a uh, hundred miles to Lake Charles, and uh, for a regular card, which did twenty-seven grand, and then we went to Baton Rouge directly from there, because we had to fly on Saturday, December first, from Baton Rouge. That's the only place you could get an actual jet to Little Rock, Arkansas, for a show there. Not a scaffold, just me hung in the straight jacket. Um, that's as a matter of fact. I think that's where they hung me from a rope. With a, uh, um, I was in a straight jacket and, um, with the, 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 the sling, the thing you sit in that they load people out of the helicopter, right? <laughs> I'm in a straight jacket and a sling and hung from a cherry picker. My legs went to fucking sleep. By the time the match was going on, when they got me down, my legs were numb. They had to drag me. I couldn't walk. <clears throat> anyway, uh, then we flew to Oklahoma City. No, we, we got a, a, uh, no, we flew to Oklahoma City because the Sunday, December 2nd was the myriad in the afternoon where we had a scaffold match, $61,000 house. And then we drove in the company van 100 miles to Tulsa that night for another scaffold match in front of a $64,000 house. Oak City got hit because, no, we weren't at the myriad. We were at the Fairgrounds Coliseum. That's why I didn't do as well because we were at the, the alternate building. But the promotion did $125,000 that day, and we made twelve fifty dollars apiece, which would be approximately $250,000 and about four grand in today's money, respectively. Then, <clears throat> we're just traveling the world. Monday, December 3rd, we made our first TV in world-class wrestling in Fort Worth. 
here was the fucking deal. When they, Dundee had came to us and told us that we were going to finish up with the rock and roll with the scaffold match series and that we would be finishing on December 15th, I believe in mid South. And this was the first of November that he told us this because we had to do the TVs and advertise the shows and everything. <laughs> so we knew we, we'd had a great year and they only, they only promised us a year if we got over and you know, we'd made a lot of money, but now they say, okay, you're done. And that's what we figured. Cause that's what used to happen all the time in wrestling, right? You got your notice when you were done and you had to go find someplace else. So Dennis Condry had been wanting to go to Charlotte forever, even before we got the chance to go to Charlotte. He said, boys, if, we, if this gets over, we can go to Charlotte. That was his dream going in because Charlotte was the, the Cadillac of NWA territories. And then Flair had come in and seen us and said, hey, you guys got to come to Charlotte. And Dusty had come in. We worked with him at the Dome in August. And he had sent word, hey, you got, you got, got to come to Charlotte. So naturally, when we heard we were finishing up, the boys appoint me to get on the phone and call Charlotte. And I talked to Dusty and Jimmy Crockett, and they were anxious to have us and told us, you guys can start, you know, you're finished up in December. If you want to take Christmas off, you can start right after Christmas, whatever the fuck. I'm like, oh, great. Okay. So we're fired up now because we're going from one big money spot to what we perceive will be another big money spot. And I told Crockett and Dusty both how much money we had made for Watts, and they said, we don't, we don't think we'll have a problem with that so then sometime in november it has not been recorded in my book dundee told me told us hey they've got you booked in dallas what well they've got you booked in dallas well why didn't you tell us this before well it just happened but watts wants to keep you next door the dallas territory was next door to mid-south so that because since he and fritz are working together he can bring you back for the Superdome or Oak City, Tulsa, or the big towns or whatever. So you would work both territories. <clears throat> and we knew that the Freebirds had just finished a run with the Von Erics where they, you know, we'd heard they'd made 150 grand a year apiece, right? Which I believe was entirely possible the way that territory was structured and with the business they did. But we didn't know that you only made money in that territory if you worked with the Von Erics. And we also didn't know we were never going to get to work with the Von Erics. Anyway, <laughs> we said, all right. Before we make any decision, call anybody back. We'll go to and see, check the deal out. We'll go to do the Dallas show. We'll go to do what we book, we're booked for, right? So Monday, December 3rd, we're booked, booked at the Fort Worth TV. They did um, <clears throat> the uh, world-class syndicated show that everybody saw around the country in Dallas at the Sportatorium every other Friday. And then every other Friday was a spot. It was a house show. But in Fort Worth, every Monday night, they did the local KTVT Channel 11 TV that was two hours every Saturday night from 10 to midnight. And that's where they promoted their local events real heavy. Well, this wasn't even in the Will Rogers Coliseum. This was in one of the exhibition buildings because the Will Rogers Coliseum, for whatever reason, was booked. So we fly to Dallas. We get in a rental car. We drive to Fort Worth. We go on the, that fairgrounds complex out there, and we see the big building, <laughs> but we're in the exhibition, and it's like, fuck, it's like, you know, a flea market building. Literally, it's where you would have a flea market and the bathrooms and the whole nine yards, and we're like, okay, this is not impressive. And they had us work with John Tatum and, and Buck Zumhoff. And that's when we found out, well, the tag matches on the Saturday night show, because it's a two-hour show and they only have 14 guys in the territory, they're two out of three falls. And they just go forever. So we had to beat these guys two straight falls, and had nothing against John and plenty against Buck, because he was a weirdo. Um, but fuck, we had, it took us like 20 minutes to beat these guys we would have beat on in Mid-South TV in four minutes. So we're like, what the fuck? Is this the way we get pushed? And we did an interview about the Fantastics. We're going to challenge the Fantastics for the American Tag Title Christmas night at Reunion Arena. This was December 3rd that we did this. And we thought, okay, at least we can work with Bobby and Tommy, whatever happens. But as we went back, we started talking. And we said, fuck, we're going to give it the Carolinas and Flair and Dusty for the fucking, you know, they're doing their TV in an exhibition building. It was not a great first impression of world class. So we decided that when we went back the next Friday for the sportatorium, we'd tell them we're sorry we had to go to Charlotte. <laughs> so anyway, on Tuesday, December 4th, we fly back over to mid South. We go to Baton Rouge, do the scaffold match in Baton Rouge, $26,000 house. 
That was a town we ran every two weeks. That's like 3,500, 4,000 people at, at uh, the ticket price of those days. Back home to Alexandria that night. The next day, we just did interviews. We were off the house show that night because we were starting to finish up. December 6th, scaffold match in Lake Charles, $25,000 house. That's where they used to have to take us out of the building with the police dogs. And the uh, people used to put Drano and water guns, try to squirt the heels in the eyes like Akbar because the cops were too good at surrounding them. So that was a nice town. Then we go from Lake Charles straight to Baton Rouge because we got to fly to Dallas. And once again, you got to get a fucking plane. So we drive two hours, two and a half hours in the opposite direction from Dallas so we can fly to Dallas the next day. And we work with the Fantastics at the Sportatorium, and they put us over the Fantastics. But that's the night, I believe, as I now try to put it all together, that we told them that we were sorry we were gonna, we'll, we'll do the match in Reunion Arena and we'll put the Fantastics over, but we've, we've got to, to go to Charlotte. And for that night, by the way, in the Sportatorium, we're just coming in. We give our notice. They paid us $300. That was one of the biggest payoffs. Every time you pissed that office off, your payoff would go up. <laughs> But we weren't used to pissing the office off. Yeah, right? We just expected the payoffs to be. Anyway, so the next day, December the 8th, we fucking fly back to Baton Rouge, which is 500 miles in a flight, so that we can get in our car and drive 100 miles back to Alexandria and have the night off. And the next day, we're in Alexandria to Repeats Parish Coliseum, scaffold match, another $20-something-thousand house. So these weeks, we're doing, you know, fucking 25, three grand a week on, you know, in Mid-South. Monday, December 10th, Tuesday, December 11th, we were off because we're, we're finishing up pretty much our dates in the territory. Um, Wednesday, and we, you know, those were towns where we had already lost a scaffold match or whatever. Wednesday, December 12th, we lose a scaffold match in Beaumont, Texas. This was blow snot, Texas, as Buddy Landell termed it. The Beaumont Civic Center, only 70 miles from Houston. That town never drew. I don't know why they didn't want to come. Every top star. We even had a last stampede there. I don't even think it did more than twenty thousand dollars. So this scaffold match, we got paid sixty bucks for. <laughs> that was a low point. So now listen to this. Here is what we have determined. We have determined that we are going to, after the first of the year, and we finish up all these dates, we're going to the Charlotte territory, and that's what Dusty and. Crockett have told us that we can do. So me and Bobby get together because Dennis at the time had about everything that he needed to have in his life in his driveway. And (laughs) it would go in his car. So he was set to go wherever. But Bobby, besides the fact he was married at the time, and and I believe, I can't remember whether he had, he may have just had Dustin, whatever. Point is, he's got furniture down there. I've got Uh, some furniture and things and such that he decides we're going to get a truck and he's going to drive this U-Haul truck from Alexandria, Louisiana, back to his house in Nashville because he still had a house in Nashville that he had had bought since he'd worked there so long. That way he can store all of my stuff and all of his stuff in Nashville. We're going to go home for – he'll be home for Nashville in Nashville for Christmas. I'll go home to Louisville for Christmas. And then we just got to drive right over the mountains and we're in the Carolinas. So it'll be great. So Bobby gets up and fucking drives this goddamn moving truck on Thursday, December 13th from Alexandria to Nashville with everything that I own and everything that he owns. All I've got is my car full when it was a small car at the time, all my clothes, all my personal items, anything I can't lose. And plus all my video machines and all my wrestling tapes and trunk of the car. That was all my, anything else could, you know, subject to debate. Right. And my truck, my car is just jammed to the fucking top. So on Friday, December 14th, we're in Greenville, Mississippi. We have a scaffold match, $12,000 house, which I believe was a sellout in Greenville. And then on Saturday, we're going to be in Little Rock. Now, Little Rock is only 500 miles from Louisville. I'm thinking, oh, if we could just finish there. But no, wait, they need us in Lafayette, Louisiana on December 16th. That's 900 miles from Louisville. And then we're done. So Bobby has driven this truck to Nashville and then driven back to Greenville, Mississippi the next day. We do the scaffold match in Greenville. The next day, I drive to Baton Rouge, get a plane, fly to Little Rock, (laughs) right? No, no, no. I tell a lie. I drove my car to Little Rock, 270 miles from Alexandria, and park my car at the Little Rock Airport. We stayed at the Holiday Inn. Sweet, sweet Connie. Um... 
after we do the scaffold match that night, which was a thirty-two thousand dollar house, about forty-five hundred, five thousand people, then I go to the airport the next day and I'm going to fly to Baton Rouge, rent a car, drive to Lafayette, do the scaffold match, drive back to Baton Rouge, fly back Monday morning, get in my car and drive on to Louisville, Kentucky. Right? I get to the airport in Lafayette. I get to the gate. I put my hand in my pocket for my ticket that I've just had in my hand when I left the hotel and I've stuffed in the side pocket of my bag as I threw my shit in the the overstuffed car. There's no fucking ticket. What the fuck? The plane's about to leave. I'm running through where have I dropped it? I I go all the way out to the parking lot. I can't find any. I'm looking around. What the fuck? Now I look down behind the seat. There'd been so much shit jammed in my car when the bag tipped over, the ticket fell out behind the seat. But now I go back in the airport. It's too late. The flight's gone. I have to get the next flight. (laughs) I had to change my flight, get the next flight to fucking Baton Rouge so that I can hop in a rental car and get to Lafayette to the Memorial Auditorium just in time to go to the ring so I can watch Bobby and Dennis drop off the fucking scaffold and pick up my fucking $200 or whatever before I goddamn go back to my hotel and the next day fly back to Little Rock. No! No! Shit, I turned the page. We've got to fly to Fort Worth again. Then we go back to Little Rock. So I went from fucking Lafayette to Baton Rouge, flew to to Fort Worth, to Dallas, rented another car, got with the boys, went to Fort Worth, did another TV where we beat Chick Donovan and Tommy Rogers. Not Bobby Fulton, Tommy Rogers, but Chick Donovan and Tommy Rogers. And it went three falls. It must have gone 45 fucking minutes. And we saw, thank God we're going to goddamn Charlotte. Because what the fuck, right? So then the, that night, <laughs> I drive back to the fucking Dallas airport. I fly back to Little Rock on the 18th. I get in my fucking car and I drive 500 miles to Louisville, Kentucky. And I arrive on December 19th. And I go shopping for some new clothes for my new spot in Charlotte. And guess what happened on December 21st? I got sick as a fucking dog. (laughs) I've got the only time I've been able to spend at home in Louisville. At my mom's house and fucking visiting whatever the fuck all year. I'm there for a day and I get horribly fucking sick. And so I'm sick the 21st, the 22nd, the 23rd, the 24th on the 25th. I have to fly down to Dallas to do the reunion arena show and I'm coming right back. So on the fucking plane, the sinus fucking problem and the goddamn congestion, my head's fucking blowing up. When I had that, it was the Christmas night match at reunion arena, star Wars, Christmas, 1984. It was the fantastics and the midnight for the American tag title. And they beat us because we were leaving. It was $185,000 house. There were 20,000 people there. We got paid 800 bucks. <laughs> But I nearly had a fucking aneurysm because I did my temper tantrum at the end of the match, right? And I had like a hundred and fucking three degree fever. I probably infected everybody on the flight. And it, it, I almost fucking had a stroke. My head was splitting and I was sweating and blah, blah, blah. So I get back to the fucking hotel that night. I'm fucking deathly ill. I fly back home on the 26th to Louisville and I spend the next fucking three days in bed. Once again, the only time I've been able to spend in Louisville, I spend the I spend the 27th, 28th, 29th in bed, and fucking on the 30th, I have to get up and get back in the car that's still packed full of everything I own because I got to drive back to fucking Dallas because now we're moving there because over the Christmas holidays, when we'd given our notice and we told them we're we're going to go to Charlotte instead, while we were I was in sick in bed, Dundee calls me. Because he knew I'd been doing the phone calling around there for the boys. Watts really wants you to go to Dallas. And he lays the guilt trip on me because Bill was convinced that he was just going to keep us over there for fucking six months, bring us back for the big shows, and then bring us back into the fucking territory. And we owed everything we had to the cowboy. And all that money he just paid us and everything. We're like, ah. So I have to call Jimmy Crockett and Dusty Rhodes. While ill (laughs) at home from Louisville, I still remember the phone call from the old dial phone in my mom's bedroom and say, well, sorry, guys, we can't come. 
Oh, fuck. And Crockett's first reply was, because I told him what was happening. I said, we owe it to this guy. You know, they the loyalty got over with, with him, right? But Crockett's first reply was, well, it's not the first time Bill Watts has fucked me. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God. Now, I've listen, I've only been in the business. Wouldn't be the last either. <laughs> but, wait, yeah, there you go. This is December 1984. I got into business in, in uh, basically October of 1982. I've been in business two fucking years, and I'm telling Jim Crockett and Dusty Rhodes that we're sorry we can't come to work with them because we're doing what Bill Watts wants, and he wants us to go work for Fritz. And Fritz and them are quite upset that we gave them their notice. I'm in the middle of this, right? I mean, what the fuck? It was almost easier when nobody cared who I was and I wasn't making any money. So I had to go through that, and they said that's when – Dusty said, look, and Crockett did too, if anything changes, you want to make a move, you just call us, you're welcome. And we, and I, like I said, I think the loyalty thing got over with him. So by the time that fucking, you know, New Year's Eve comes, we are booked New Year's Eve in Fort Worth, Texas. And it was the goddamn uh, 800, 900 miles. No, what was it? 800, I think it's 875 miles from Louisville to Dallas. I left on December 30th. I had to stop in Texarkana on the way because I was so sick I couldn't make it the rest of the way. On New Year's Eve, I get up in Texarkana, Arkansas, and I'm driving down the interstate to Dallas where we got to work that night, and I'm going to live from apparently then on. I'm still so sick, I stopped, <laughs> pulled over on the side of the interstate, got out, and started vomiting in the middle of broad daylight. And I'm like, fuck. I finally get to the La Quinta at the, in Irving, Texas at the DFW airport, which would be mine and Bobby's command center for the next fucking month or so. Cause remember all my shit's still in Nashville. Now we got to figure out what we're going to do with that. And instead of being, <laughs> I moved it from Alexandria, Louisiana, which was a goddamn five hour drive from Dallas to fucking uh, over twice as far away. I stop. I check in the hotel. I get to Fort Worth. And that's the night it sold out because that was the infamous night, I believe, that Flair worked with Carrie for the title at the Will Rogers Coliseum. And they went an hour on fuck it. They went an hour and they showed part of it on TV. And that's when they had to get Carrie out of the cattle chute five minutes before the match and lead him to the fucking ring. So we go in and the building is sold out and we see Flair there. And of course, you know, and, and he knows what's been going on. But our contribution of the night was. Bobby Eaton going 15 minutes Broadway with Tommy Rogers and Dennis going two out of three with Bobby Fulton until Bobby beat him because that was the deal in, in Dallas. There was 14 guys in the full-time territory and they just split up and did singles matches and two out of three falls to, to get time. And so we're thinking, what the fuck? What, you know, is, is, is this what we're, you know, in captain's matches? And so we ended up, as as has been told and will be told again at a later time, we stayed about six months and had a pretty much a paid vacation of making about $1,000 a week, never working with the fucking Von Erics. And the and the biggest payoff we got was, was my last night in when I worked with Sunshine in Fort Worth. I think I got $1,100. But... The moral to that story and the end of that is on, on New Year's Day, uh, I woke up after I finished that fucking night, at, that insane night at the Will Rogers Coliseum. Oh, you should have seen just what they showed on TV with Flair and Kerry. They had to say that Kerry was working against doctor's orders with 102 degree fever. He got Flair down for a hammerlock and did the old baby face deal where he'd do a handstand and drop the knee on the fucking arm. He did the handstand. He went all the way over the other way, landed on his back. <laughs> And he's coming off the ropes and Flair goes to hip toss him and fucking Kerry takes a hip toss without his right foot ever leaving the fucking ground. And it was just, it was God, it was bizarre. They had to say he didn't want to let his fans down, but he was obviously delirious and in no condition. He should have been hospitalized. He should have been. They found him in his fucking car at the cattle chute behind the Will Rogers Coliseum and drug him to the ring. That, that's when they went the hour and then Flair comes back with the fucking belt in his hand and there's Ken Mantell, the booker, and he throws the fucking belt at Ken Mantell and says, here, you work with him the rest of the fucking week. So anyway, I got back to my La Quinta from that experience and it was still sick and went to sleep and woke up the next day. It was New Year's Day. I'm saying, okay, we're off. I feel a little bit better. I'll probably, you know, uh, uh, go out and find something nice to eat, eat, 
It's about 1230, one o'clock in the afternoon when I finally wake up. I've got my drapes closed in the hotel, so I don't know what the fuck's going on. I get up and put a few clothes on, open the door. There's six inches of fucking snow in Dallas, Texas. The whole town was at a standstill. I couldn't, people had parked their cars on the side of the interstate because they didn't know how to drive in six inches of fucking snow. The only thing open was the 7-Eleven across the street where I dined on the fucking, remember they had the machine at that point where you could get the chicken nuggets out of the fucking frozen food case, stick them in the machine and it would dump them in oil and fry them on the spot. That's what I ate for a day and a half while Dallas recovered from the blizzard of 85. And then we we uh, ended up uh, Thursday of uh, January 3rd, just so you know, our official introduction to the Dallas Territory after we moved there was going to Crystal City, Texas, which was over 400 miles each way to South Texas to work with Tommy Rogers and Mike Von Erich, where we got disqualified and made $100 fucking dollars because that was the South Texas slums, and it was a $100 guarantee if you if you went there. They didn't. They put eight people and a referee on a and a manager on a fucking card. It still didn't draw, and everybody got a hundred bucks and spent more than that to get there. So anyway, <laughs> so that was my Thanksgiving to New Year's period thirty three years ago, and I'm going to tell you what I've enjoyed. Even though there were some great times then, I've enjoyed this Thanksgiving to New Year's period quite a bit more. More profitable. What the fuck? How the fuck? Well, and, and actually, and I've made, but <laughs> when you think about it, I've made more money than I did doing all those things. But going back to once again to put a period on this, although if you have any questions, I'll be glad to open the floor. Once again, everybody always says, oh, cornet bitches and wines. Wrestling's bigger than ever. No, it's fucking not. Simple goddamn mathematics indicates it's not. The boys have allowed themselves to be devalued by letting silly guys do stupid fucking horse shit that gets over with people instead of having to have talent. And the promotions have encouraged it. And as I mentioned in the past, the five highest paid professional athletes in the United States of America in the early 1950s were the world heavyweight boxing champion and four wrestlers. Now it's not even a contest. But as far as territory business... In December 1984, at that point, I, I totaled up the four most successful towns in the Mid-South Territory. Mid-South Wrestling was one of about 20 full-time territories at that time across the country, running regular schedules with a regular talent roster. Just four of their cities in 1984, New Orleans, Houston, Oklahoma City, and Tulsa. Oak City for about 24 shows every two weeks, did 180,000 fans paid and about 1.25 million. Tulsa had 21 events that year and did about 100,000 paid and over $700,000 at the gate. So four cities accounted for 600,000 paid admissions and $4.3 million at the gate, which is $10.2 million in today's money. That was one of 20 full-time promotions in the country. It wasn't certainly wasn't the smallest one, but it wasn't even the third biggest one. So fuck all y'all that think that wrestling has yeah. gotten bigger. I'm just, I've, it's like when people tell me they support Trump or believe in God, I hang my mouth and say, what the fuck? You can't read. You can't watch video. You can't look at pictures. You can't see this is not the case. I don't, I, I, eh, eh. questions, my boy, about those days. <laughs> that first night in Fort Worth. You know, you guys really don't want to be there, and you're there, and let's forget about the whole experience working with Zoomhoff, you know, during that match. But what is it like for you when you arrive there? Who do you talk to? Does Ken Mantell come up to you? Do you go up to him? Is Fritz actually even there in Fort Worth that night? What was that experience like, just arriving and, and integrating yourself to the, you know, world-class locker room? Fritz was not there that night. Fritz would be at the sportatorium and sometimes he'd even come down to the locker room. And every once I remember one time he actually called me aside in Fort Worth at the Will Rogers Coliseum. One of the first couple of weeks we'd been there. He wasn't there all the time, but he was there that night. And he said, boy, I just wanted to tell you what a good job he'd been doing. I don't know how you remember all those matches and things. Cause we were plugging on the Fort Worth show. We'd plug Dallas on Friday and Fort Worth on Monday and the big star Wars event coming up or in, and then I was managing the midnight, but also I was, uh, uh, managing Rip Oliver for a while. He said, I don't know how you keep it all straight. I said, well, I'm just 
trying hard, sir. He had the big fucking hearing aids in both ears and those giant cauliflower ears. But he, you didn't see a lot of him. I mean, he was always in his office at the Sportatorium, which was up. It, but we dealt with Ken Mantell. You know, it was up upstairs uh, where we dealt with Ken Mantell, the the office that he had right next to the little outer office Bronco Lubitsch should sit in down in the locker room area, the Sportatorium. But yeah, Ken Mantell was, and it wasn't a regular building for them either. So they were making, you know, making do with some rooms and everything. But uh, Ken Mantell was the booker. David Manning, the referee, uh, was an assistant. Bronco was also was an assistant. Um, and really, as far as the crew welcoming us, you know, except for the Fantastics, we already knew. Um, it was Gino and Chris and Gary Hart was the heel side and one man gang. And then Kelly Kaniski, uh, I think well, he was there at, at one point, may have not been there at that time. But literally, there was only they, for the big shows, they would have guys work twice or they'd bring in flair or they'd do something special or whatever. But for the average shows, it was the tag team thing, Midnight and Fantastics. It was um, Iceman Parsons, uh, you know, the, the, the underneath kind of single baby face that won some and lost some that spot, uh, which as uh, it was Scott Casey, a lot of time that we were there and a preliminary guy. And then the Von Eric boys against Gino and Chris and gang. So there was like fucking literally 16 guys on the roster on most of the shows. So <laughs> we knew some of them. So it wasn't like a big fucking, you know, uh, 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 inauguration ingratiation period. And they knew what we had done, you know, in Mid-South. I, I'm sure Gino and Chris were not happy to see us. And everybody else probably was because Gino and Chris wanted the spot with the Von Ericks because they had homesteaded it and they could make a fortune. They inherited the Freebird spot with the Von Ericks. The boys liked working with them. They were good. They took care of the boys. They were great heels. But, you know, let's face it, I'm not telling tales out of school here. Gino Hernandez and Chris Adams were not either nearly the workers of Bobby and Dennis Condry were nobody. I don't think ever said that. So I'm sure when we came in, they thought, what the fuck? But also Gary Hart was their manager and he'd been with Fritz for fucking 20 fucking years. And he was in the office. Uh, it, he was in the office even when he wasn't in the office. Cause that was Gary and he knew what he was doing. And so there was no way once we got there and found this out that we were going to break into working programs with the Von Ericks. Cause that was homesteaded. Because if we went and had the tag team match and made $200 on a spot show, uh, the guys working with the single match, Gino versus Kerry or Chris versus Kevin, they were going to make twice that because it was a single main event. And that's the way they did payoffs in those days. And to, to be perfectly honest, it, it, the Dallas Metroplex was a big money market. But Dallas, the, the world-class territory at the time, they didn't have the towns that other territories had, especially not Mid-South. You know, San Antonio might do 10 to 20 grand when we were there. They'd already been the, – Joe Blanchard had gone out of business, and there'd been Texas All-Star Wrestling with Fred Barron and Outlaw Promotions and back and forth. Uh, so San Antonio was on its ass, and South Texas was dead. That's why there was a $100 minimum because those towns would only do five or six grand, and they ran them as political favors. If we went out west to, to Lubbock and Amarillo, it'd be between uh, seven, eight, and 12, 13 grand for houses there. So that was a couple of hundred bucks. El Paso, we went to one time. The, Gore, the Guerreros, Gory Guerrero promoted it. And they did like 30 grand there. And because there was only eight guys on a card, we made like 500 bucks a piece. But that was just once in a while. It was the Dallas Metroplex, the spot shows where you could go. 20 or 40 or 60 miles and go to a high school show and pick up a couple hundred bucks and then be in Dallas on Friday and Fort Worth on Monday, you averaged out about a thousand dollars a week in our spot on the card. And then those big reunion arena, cotton bowl, Texas stadium, they do huge fucking gates because it was a huge market, but the territory as a whole, you know, that was, I've said it before is not to knock it. You know, I'd, I'd been making, I hadn't even been averaging 300 bucks a week when I left Tennessee. And so we're making a thousand dollars a week there, but we had been making more than 2000, sometimes 4,000 a week. We'd made a hundred grand with Bill Watts. We're, you know, it's like a, you know, a fucking rib now. And when their relationship fell apart, as was a question on the drive through this past week, all of a sudden we're in Dallas where Bill wanted us to go. 
But now he and Fritz are fighting. So instead of being in the Superdome, we're in Corsicana, Texas at the rodeo arena. When we when they were bringing us back over for Oak City and Tulsa, we'd make as much in one day on a Sunday work in Oak City and Tulsa as we would the rest of the week in Dallas. And they uh, Easter Sunday, we were in Houston as a favor, I'm sure, for Paul Bosch because we had that big four-team match with the the Rock and Roll, the Free Birds, Michael Buddy and Terry, the only time we got to do that, and uh, the Dirty White Boys. And, you know, Houston made our fucking week again because it, it outdrew the rest of the Dallas territory combined that week. I think, uh, God, I can't hold on. Let me look for a, a second here, and I will tell you exactly what it was. Houston, Texas, on Easter Sunday of 1985, did a $75,000 house. Dallas, that Friday night at the Sportatorium, had done seventeen grand. <laughs> so we literally made half, we made half the money we made that week in one day working for uh, Watts and Paul Bosch in Houston. So that was the point. The point was we weren't figured in. It was a small-time territory that had got really hot with the Freebirds and the Von Erich boys being so hot, they were like rock stars in Dallas. But it wasn't, you know, hot across the whole state. And it was time for us to go. Have you ever thought about, knowing what you know now, what, if any, repercussions there would have been if you had decided to not go to world class? If you had told Bill Watts, we're sorry, but we want to go to Crockett. We want to go to the Carolinas now. Well, it- <laughs> Probably knowing Bill after he wouldn't have been that mad at us and he probably would have used us again. We were just scared shitless and, and you know, pea green because we were new and we owed him. Um, and it, as it turned out, we never really had a chance to work for him again anyway, uh, except for just visiting for a shot or two when because we, we were pretty much with Crockett for the rest of our, our lives. Um, you know, and, and we mentioned on the drive through that uh, it may have been a different dynamic with us going into Charlotte before the rock and roll instead of them getting established and us coming in to fuck with them. But in the end, we actually probably – I've always said it this way. If we'd have gone straight to Charlotte, we would have made more money because even though that was a down period where Dusty was putting a crew in place and building some things and they were just yet to get the TBS time slot, that would happen shortly – it was still down when we did go to work for him, and he gave us a guarantee. Um, he said, you'll make at least as much money as you've been making in Dallas, if not more, from the get-go. And if we didn't for the first few weeks when he had us in small towns or whatever, he bonused us. So he already knew he knew what we'd been making with Watts, and he would have been competitive with that. So actually, we'd have made more money if we'd have went right away because he had to be competitive with Dallas's money instead of fucking Watts's money. Uh, but it would have hopefully ended up pretty much the same we just it it was a boon to us we probably performed better by the time we got to atlanta because we were so fucking burnt as as you can imagine that schedule i mean all those scaffold matches imagine the boys were making the same trips i were i was and they were taking the bumps off the scaffold every night after working for louisiana for in working the louisiana territory for a year we needed to get somewhere where we could have a couple days off a week and we could have some short trips just to regain our fucking sanity. So we were better rested when we finally debuted in, in, uh, on Atlanta TV and, and, you know, Bobby's Bobby had even put on a little weight, <laughs> which he had a hard time doing because he always worked so hard when he was in Tennessee and in Louisiana, but he actually put on a little weight and had a little more oomph behind him. I don't mean he's got fat. I mean, he actually filled out a little bit by the time we made Atlanta TV. One last question. Mid-South really couldn't have gone any better for you. You went in there as the junior manager from Memphis, and you kind of, like, from the moment you show up in Mid-South, there's a confidence you never had in Memphis on TV. You you never were able to show, and you were always going to be, as long as Jimmy Hart was there, the number two manager, and you kill it in Mid-South. At what point during that run do you start thinking about what is next, and what did you think at that time? Did you think, I'll go back to Memphis? Did you think, before you got the offer from Dusty or Flair, that there was going to be an opportunity in the Carolinas. Where did you think in the middle of Mid-South before you had answers? Where did you think you were going to go next? Uh, the answer to that is I don't have a fucking clue. Um, it, it went in kind of stages like this. At first, when we got there, the first three months, it, Dennis Dennis always, you know, predicted it. But at the same time, he could have been wrong. And, you know, <laughs> it just happened he was right. But he thought we were going to get over. 
And he thought that if we get over and 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 we do what what he thinks that we can do, that we could, that he always wanted to go to the Carolinas. He mentioned that from the start that that would be, because I mean they had Slater and Orton. My God, you know, Steamboat and Youngblood, the tradition of tag teams there in the Carolinas. So he wanted that from the start. I was just gobsmacked for the first three months that, holy shit, we have come down here in this fucking territory that's bigger than I've ever dreamed of, you know, a territory being. I'm seeing all these big buildings and we are the main event and we're over and we've got heat and we're drawing fucking money. This is that was insane. Then. Through the summertime, I started to see the end of it because after we, you know, booted the rock and roll out and they went back to Memphis, you know, we had programs with Coco Ware and Norvell Austin who were the PYTs and they brought the Fantastics in and those were great matches, but they didn't do the business. And I thought, well, he might want to boot us out, but then the rock and roll gave us some new life. <laughs> so I'm thinking, and that, by that time we had uh, met Flair and, and, and talked to Dusty. So really... As as stupid as this may seem, I was just worried about how long can we be here in Mid South before it's over with, because all things have to come to an end. Until the point, I didn't know that I'd go anywhere else except maybe back home to Memphis. Until we met Flair and Dusty, and then it was obvious that we could go to the Carolinas. So I went from barely having a favor job in in Memphis in November of '83 because nobody wanted to be the one to piss Christine Jarrett off, to now having to fucking argue and make phone calls a year later to Fritz von Erich or Bill Watts or Jimmy Crockett as to who we're going to work for <laughs> to <laughs> it just, it was, it, it was bizarre. So, and then once we, you know, once we made the detour to Dallas and just, and like I said, paid vacation, once we got to work for Crockett at that point, I said, there's, there's no other, territory or promotion in the business that we would rather be in look at this fucking roster look at these towns look at his tv that's why we never left and they didn't ask us to leave all right well there you have it <laughs> you know that's always a thing sometimes it's it, as seinfeld said it's not the taking of the reservation it's the holding of the reservation it's not whether you want to leave or not it's whether they want you to stay or not um and thankfully up until you know Turner Broadcasting got involved and, and the whole business went to hell. Uh, we were always asked to stay because that's why a lot of times people ask me, well, did you ever work so-and-so or did you ever work here or there? Really? I would have loved to before all those territories went away. But after I was in Memphis for about 14 months and then I was in Louisiana for a year. And from then on, it was pretty much determined by, you know, the places we went, especially by the time we got to work for Crockett, to give our notice and go anywhere else except New York would have been a step down in money. And we've covered that fucking road before. So there was no reason to go anywhere. 